And so quite frequently then when I'm doing any kind of work, especially if I'm doing consulting work, right, and it's going to end up in a court of law, that almost always brings a lawyer, you know, and I've personally experienced this, they will say, you know, well, how do you deal with uncertainty in your data? How certain are you that your measurements are accurate, representative, and so on, right? And there's a reality in science, everybody, that uncertainty is something we just live with. <coughs> okay, uncertainty doesn't mean to say your data isn't true. It doesn't mean to say Cadence messed up his experiments or massaged his data in any way. It's just a fact of life, right? We are never really certain of anything to 100%. So what I'm showing on the screen here, we're gonna come back and look at this in the second uh, third of this course. Okay, we're looking at global surface temperature change on the y-axis here and year on the bottom, okay? And what we're looking at is global surface temperatures. So this is the black line over here. And then we get up to 2000. And this is actually 2018, I think, over there. And then we have these lines that all spread out, right? The blues, light blues, oranges, and, and the reds. What are those? Those are predictions from computer models that have been extremely well thought through, very, very complicated computer models. Four computer models, right? And as Caitlin said, you want to look at some other studies. These are four climate centers around the world, two in the United States, one in England and one in Russia, right? And those predictions are where global temperatures are possibly going to be by the end of the century. In other words, this is the projection of global warming. Right, of the ramping up of global temperature. So what do you look at here? Well, and, and the, the horizontal bars on the, on the right-hand side sort of capture the variability around those individual predictions, right? So the solid blue one suggests that by 2100, global temperatures might be going up by about another half a degree, another three quarters of a degree, give or take that spread. The red one suggests global temperatures by the end of the century will be going up four degrees Celsius it will take that spread, right? So you look at that and you put that in front of the general public and you say, well, what's global warming going to be? And how certain are we that we are committed to another two degrees Celsius warming or not, right? And if you have the slightest uncertainty, then there's a group of people that will say, well, this is nonsense. Why should we make policy that might impact our economies, both here and globally, based on data that suggests that global warming may be almost nothing. Now, okay, it might be four degrees Celsius, okay? And as we'll see later on, everybody, a four degrees Celsius change in the climate is significant no matter how you cut it, right? There's just no other way to frame it. But it may be uh, only a degree or so, right? So, so how do we deal with that? How do we deal with that scientifically? Most importantly, how do we deal with that from a policy perspective, right? Put yourself in Washington, D.C. And you have to make policy on energy based on the global climate predictions. And you're sitting there and you're going, geez, man, there's a lot of uncertainty there, right? It may be little, it may be moderate, it may be catastrophic. What do I do? What is my recommendation? Do I sit back and just wait and see and say, you know what, let's just give it another 10 years, let's just give it another 20 years until we're a little more certain, until we can kind of get a little more confidence? Or do we say, let's put some really significant policies in place to try and curb climate change, and then let's just see what happens. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to get at? Uncertainty is just something that is inherent in science. We embrace it, we report it, we have to ethically report how certain we are, okay? And we, again, we do that based on, on confident intervals. Here's an example, right? I've taken this uh, from last year, this was August last year. Now we've just had Hurricane Ida come through um, Louisiana, right? But let's go back uh, to August the 23rd, 2020. And we had two storm systems in the Gulf of Mexico, right? So, the, so what you, and you'll probably recognize these kind of maps from what we've seen on TV. So this one here, this map on the left, the X is where this tropical storm Marco was at 7 a.m. on Sunday. By 1 a.m. on Monday, it was predicted to be a, an H, a hurricane, right? And as you can see over here, it was predicted to be a hurricane and make landfall right along the Louisiana coast at 1 p.m. on Monday. On the right-hand side, these are called spaghetti models for obvious reasons. 
these are a variety of computer predictions. There's a computer model that's run every three hours with slightly different conditions. We don't have to worry about that, right? So the computer models will all say, you know what, we've got strong agreement. If you're living in the coastline of Louisiana, especially on the mouth of the Mississippi, by 1 p.m. Monday, you're going to have a major hurricane on your hand. Okay, that's what happened to Marco. <coughs> Nothing. Storm died out, didn't make landfall. And by 4 a.m. Tuesday, it was just some clustered thunderstorms. Something went horribly wrong, right? Okay. There was a lot of, it seemed like there was a lot of certainty in the computer predictions, but something changed, right? Our ability to predict sometimes it's very good and sometimes it's very bad. So here is the same time, August the 23rd, 2020 exactly the same time as Marco was developing, this was Tropical Storm Laura. So Tropical Storm Laura was brewing here in the Caribbean, right? And it was supposed to make landfall here as a hurricane just on the eastern side of the Louisiana shoreline at 2 a.m. Thursday. The spaghetti diagrams were a little bit more confluent. They were a bit more confident, a bit more predictable. So there it was, 2 a.m. Thursday, it was supposed to be a hurricane. And where did it make landfall? Exactly where it was predicted, actually about 50 miles of west it was predicted. And it wasn't just a hurricane, it was a major hurricane. So it actually strengthened, right? So my point here, everybody, is just, we have to acknowledge that when we start dealing with data in this class, all the natural sciences, I suppose, or any data, right? But when we, when we have data, and then someone asks us to make a prediction, Okay, we're getting into much more difficult territory. Sometimes our predictions are much easier to make, right? So we have a pretty good idea what the population of the world will be in 2050. Uh, but sometimes it's very difficult to make these predictions. And we just have to acknowledge it. And we have to say, how do we deal with that as a, as a policy maker? Right? And then finally, my final sort of th uh, thoughts here are, oh, so I'm just going to skip that. I've already talked about this, right? Uh, we deal with variability in terms of an acceptable level of error. And uncertainty does not imply we don't know, right? Uncertainty is just, these are the confidence limits that we can wrap around this, okay? Doesn't imply that we just are guessing. Uh, it's just how we deal with it, right? Um, two important terms here in terms of variability, and this is what I just want to end on, are the terms accuracy and precision, okay? In, in, when we're looking at collecting data scientifically, accuracy and precision. And this is just this, the simple difference between the two, right? We would hope that all of our data is accurate and precise, okay? But sometimes it's not. So on the left-hand side, we've got a target here and we've got four, you know, that can be bullet holes or arrows or whatever the case around the target, okay? Those four are pretty close to the real value. They're pretty close to the bullseye. Not very precise, but they're quite accurate in terms of where they're supposed to be. On the right hand side, okay, much more precise measurement, all four plus tightly in one spot, but not real accurate. Does that make sense? Right? So just keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this class. And hopefully we're looking for accuracy and precision. And sometimes we get one or the other, and sometimes we get neither, and then we have to make decisions <laughs> based on some pretty sketchy data, but that's just the way it is. Okay, that's science. I hope that maybe relay some of your fears about doing science in this class. Hopefully it hasn't done the opposite. Question. Question, questions. Everybody good? Everybody happy? Okay. All right, everybody. So now we go on to chapter two, uh, population. So um, when I look at different environmental courses or books, it's interesting to see where population comes in. Some people bring it right up front. Some people do population right at the end. I decided to do population up front here because I think there's an argument that most of what we see in terms of environmental degradation, maybe all of what we see, is due to the fact that we've been an extraordinarily successful species. Right? Uh, I put seven billion there because that was a fundamental watershed in 2011, I remember well, when the world went through 7 billion people, right? And an article, article came out, and this was the, the picture from that article in the National Geographic, and it was titled 7 billion and beyond, right? So where, where are we headed? Where are we headed, rather? 8 
it 9, is it 10, is it 11, and much more importantly, what does it mean? It means in terms of resources, consumption, human lifespans, there's a whole series of things. Again, it's quite a strong argument, and, and just to be transparent, I'm one of them that would strongly support it, and that is that because we've been so successful, we have had a dramatic impact on the planet, right? So humans are driving a lot of things. Here's where we're going uh, over the next couple of lectures. So populations will take two lectures to take the rest of the morning. And then uh, next Wednesday, when we meet again, I'll be horribly jet lagged, but that's okay. Um, we'll talk about global demographics. Here's what we're looking at. One, we're gonna look at how populations grow. Okay. That may seem just like blatantly obvious, but it's not because there's some subtleties to that. So we're going to look at growth dynamics in populations, specifically relating to human populations. And I suppose, and we'll cover a few things, but I suppose that will all lead to this very important concept, which is carrying capacity, right? How many people can the planet support? I mean, that's the key question, ultimately. Because if Earth can support 12 billion people, then why are we getting all bent out of shape? Right? If the carrying capacity of the planet is 12 billion, we should be good. But what if it's 5 billion? And now we are living in a sense on borrowed time, right? We are borrowing from our ecosystems to sustain the current population. The carrying capacity is something we're gonna look at. Hopefully we get to the end of that today. So those are the first two big themes as part of demographics. The third one is global demographics. This we will pick up next Wednesday. And that little diagram there, it's a, it's a small version of it. You can see the outline of the continents. That's a, that's a population density diagram, right? So we're gonna talk a lot about demographics, the study of populations globally, okay? And my goal here, everyone, is not to bug you down in just tons and tons of stats on global populations. I know when you go in the book, there are some stats there and that's back up, but my, my goal in lecture is to kind of take this 35,000 foot approach and give you the big picture. So yeah, when you look at this part of the world here, right? So this one over here where you see India and China, uh, South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, you can just see how dark that is, right? There are more people living inside that area than outside that area. And we're going to, going to examine that. Uh, and then we're going to make this link between people and food, right? Oh, by the way, you know, nine and a half billion people probably want to eat. Okay, and so there's a very important food component. Now, I, I realize that some of you may think, gosh, we should probably have an entire chapter on food. Uh, and I probably should, right? But I'm going to tie the food component in to population. Go back and look at food at several junctions in this course. Not in any significant way, but for example, when we look at land degradation, if we're losing soil, we need soil to grow food, right? If we're over fertilizing crops, that impacts our food production. So you'll see food pop up a couple of times here, but for the moment, uh, we'll tie it in here. So that's the roadmap. All good. Okay, cool. Let's get going. Okay, so yeah, we. So I think I made the comment humans do two things very well, right? Reproduce very well pretty good at it and we improve our condition like we always i think are driven to improve the human condition and, and that has implications where do you fit in to this seven billion the world's population at the moment is about 7.8 right somewhere in there okay we don't know exactly how precise or accurate that measurement is but we know from global uh, census data and from demographic models that we're probably at about 7.8. So this is me. Um, so it's a graph from 1500, 1950, 2000, 2050. And I just, this is a cool little website. There are lots of these uh, things on the web. And then uh, I just put my birthday. Here, okay. So 5th of November, 1964. I know that's a whole other deal. epoch back there. And when I was born, apparently, I was the 3 billion, 319 million, 727,869 person to pop out on my birthday. I mean, give or take, right? That's obviously not exactly my number, but apparently I was at about the 3.3-ish 3 .3 billion back in 1964, right? Now, I'm not going to take a 
census here on exactly your ages, but let's say the average age in the class here is, I don't know, 20 ish, something like that might be a, a reasonable guess. So if we put that in, actually, if we say, let's assume all of you were born uh, in 2000 on that same day, right? I know some of you were born post 2000, maybe a little before, but 2000, that would put you at 21. You are somewhere in the 6.3 billion on this planet. I mean, people say, right? So that's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, I know I'm older and grayer, right? But in this room, we've got people where we've added another 3 billion people, right? We've doubled the world's population by the, from the time I was born to more or less the time you were born, right? That's extraordinary. A double of the world's population. Okay. And of course, the, the key question is where are we going to go from here? So that's that's what we're going to look at. So how do populations grow? Okay, so we're going to talk about birth rates and death rates and how we calculate population growth. Let me just give you a heads up. Um, in the exam, what I do is I don't just say what is a birth rate, right? I want you to understand how we calculate birth rates, death rates, and growth rates. And then I'm gonna give you some data that you've never seen before. And as long as you understand the concept, you should be perfectly good to go. So here's the most important, right? Populations obviously grow depending on the number of births, right? And we express that as the birth rate. So that's little b, and it's the number of births normalized to every thousand people, right? The number of births per thousand people, because it's no good if you want to get an understanding of global demographics to compare the number of births, say, for example, in India in a year, relative to the number of births on the island of Seychelles, right? One has a gigantically large population, and you're going to have many, many more babies born in India than the Seychelles. The question is, how relative are those birth rates to one another, right? So the number of births per thousand per year. That's how we express the birth rate. And I'll show you a very simple calculator as we go through. Please, folks, stop me or interrupt if something doesn't make sense. Okay? So we've got the birth rates on the one hand. And then, of course, it's how many people die, right? There's a harsh reality. At some point, we all go through this little phase, right? And we express the, the death rate uh, in the same way as the birth rate. So D is the death rate. That's the number of deaths per thousand per year. Okay? So births and deaths are obviously the two key indicators of population growth. We look at the relationship between the birth rate and the death rate, and that gives us R, right? The growth rate. Sometimes we refer to that as, if it's written as RNI, you'll see that written somewhere uh, in various publications. That's just the rate of natural increase, right? The rate of natural increase is the birth rate minus the death rate, okay? So here's how this looks. I know it looks like there's lots of zeros on the screen. So let's say we've got a population of 10,000, right? This is a pretty small country and it's got a population of 10,000. And in a year, we have 2,000 births, right? So B, as you can see there, is 2,000 per year or 200 per thousand, right? Formalize that, okay? And the number of deaths are 1,000 per year or 100 deaths thousand people. Okay. So to calculate the growth rate or the rate of natural increase is super straightforward. You just take the birth rate, which is 200 per thousand, or that's 0.2, minus the death rate, which is 100 per thousand, right? 100 divided by 1,000 is 0.1, right? So it's 0.2 minus 0.1 leaves 0.1 as a decimal. 0.1 as a decimal is 10%, right? Everybody see that? Simple and straightforward. So if you've got a population of 10,000 that has 2,000 births in a year and 1,000 deaths in a year, the rate of natural increase is 10% in that population. Please don't be embarrassed if you don't see that. Fire away, ask away. Same thing. So that, I'm glad you mentioned that because and sometimes I do this and I, I don't really think about it. I'll say, so the growth rate of this country is, okay? And, and the reason I say that is we've also got to account for immigrants and emigrants, right? So this is just R, the rate of natural increase. Some people use R 
as the rate of natural increase, some folks will use R as the growth rate, including immigration, but we'll clarify that in a second. So do you think a, do you think a population growth rate of 10% is high or low or average? Is it got to that? 10% now high or low? High? Yeah. That's catastrophically high in terms of population, right? And you'll see that in a second. One way of quantifying that is using the doubling time. Now, if any of you are business majors, you'll probably be familiar with this rule, right? It's known as the rule of seven. We can express demographic growth in terms of the doubling time, the amount of time it would take for a population to double in size with one really important assumption, right? And that, that assumption is that the rate of natural increase is constant. R is constant. Okay. And the doubling time, and I've written it here as TD, right, is the rule of 70. And it is written here as 0.7 divided by R, right? If you are expressing R as a decimal, if you're expressing R as a full percentage, i.e. 10%, then you take 70 divided by R, if you express it as a full percentage, right? So if your growth rate is 10%, What's the doubling time of that population? The population is growing at 10%. It's 70 divided by the growth rate. 70 divided by 10. That's seven years. So if you're expressing it as a decimal, it's 0.7 divided by 0.1. It's seven years. Does that make sense? That's the rule of 70. For the business people here, if you're going to portfolio management and investments, when I meet with my financial advisor, um, I'm just hoping for 10% return on my investments every year. In other words, my portfolio should double every seven years right that's kind of the i don't know the target for most investments unless you're dabbling in dogecoin or something like that right but i'm a conservative investor so that's the doubling time we can express the population will double in a certain number of years but i cannot stress how important it is to assume a constant r if your r is changing going down or going up then your doubling time is changing right so it's not an exact exact science Oh, good. Okay. Then finally, we have to take into account people like me to come into a country and some others who leave, right? Immigration, individuals entering, and immigrants with an E, individuals leaving the population. Now, I know this can be a complicated, it is a complicated issue, and I know it's, it's based in politics and world views and all of that. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. I'm just presenting the data here as you as to how you look at a population, right? So to calculate the total growth of a particular population, you take the birth rate and the death rate, and you also have to account for the people coming in and the people going out, right? Now this looks a bit complicated, but it's just as easy as the previous ones. So let's assume we've still got a population of 10,000 people and we've got births of 1,000 people Right per 10,000, and we've got deaths of 500 per 10,000. We've got 10 people coming in for every 10,000 people in that population. The immigration with an I is 10, and for every 10,000 E immigrants leaving are 100. Apparently, this is the place where people want to leave rather than come in. Okay, so to, to calculate the actual growth rate, the total growth rate, when you look at this set of parentheses over here on the right, okay. It's the birth rate minus the death rate. So that 0 0.1 is the birth rate, right? Or 1,000 divided by 10,000, that's 0 0.1. The death rate is 0 0.05. That's the 500 divided by the total population. Plus the immigrants coming in, 10 divided by 10,000 is 0 0.001, minus the immigrants leaving, right? 100 divided by 10,000 is 0 0.01. That all works out if you just take the birth rate minus the death rate and you add to it the immigrants minus the immigrants, that comes out at an actual growth rate of 0.041 or 4.1%, right? And the doubling time is 0.7 divided by 0.041, or you could just do the full 17 divided by 4.1. The doubling time of that population is 17 years. Does that make sense? Pretty straight. I mean, that's straightforward. 
Okay. So that's how we look at population growth, the rate of natural increase, and then the actual total growth of a population. And then in the exam, I'll just give you a simple calculation to real say, here's a population, here's the birth rate, the death rate, the immigration, the immigration. What's the rate of increase? What's the rate of natural increase? How quickly will this population double? Easy marks, money for jam. Okay. So why is immigration so important? Well, let's just look at a place like the United States, right? So we have more people coming in than any other country. I was very lucky to immigrate to this country in 1994, right? So when we look at this diagram here, this shows the percent of the US population, right? That is foreign born. So that's the percent of the US population that's foreign born. And I've just highlighted 1850 here, 19, 19, 70 years. This is 2018 on the big circles. So those numbers represent percentages, right? So you can see that just at the turn of the century, we had about 15% of the US population that was foreign born. By the 1970s, we were down to less than 5%. Now we're up back up to 14.7, right? We're on this cycle of immigration into the United States. And when you look at just how important immigration is in terms of the total growth of population here in the United States, I've kind of summarized this in these two boxes, okay? The natural increase in population in the US between 2014 and 2018, so in that five-year period, the rate of natural increase, the true RNR, okay, was 6.28 million people. In other words, just looking at the births minus the deaths in the US, five years, we added 6.28 million people. We also added another 2.41 million people through immigration, both documented or undocumented, however you want to phrase it, right? In other words, a good solid 30% of the population increase in the United States was due to immigration. Okay? And of course, in other countries, that number changes uh, dramatically. Does that make sense? All good, everybody happy? Pretty simple, straightforward concept. Okay, so what I plotted here is just to show you some 2019 data, should update this. Um, it just shows the impact of the growth rate relative to the doubling time, right? Just to give you a sense that this is actually a non-linear relationship. In other words, when and then I'll just pull out some countries here, okay? So when you look at the left-hand side here, the population growth rate of 10%, and if you came straight down to this axis over here, population growth rate of 10%, that would come right down to seven years over there. At least it shook the rule of 70, okay? So you look at a country like Nigeria in 2019, that had a growth rate of 2.57. It doesn't sound very big, right? But 2.57 has a doubling time of 27 years. And next week, we're gonna look at a country like that and what the ramifications of that might be. We go to Saudi Arabia, that's got a growth rate of 1.6%. It's got a doubling time of 44 years. The United States, the 2019 growth rate in the US was 0.59%. Okay. And, and so this is the true growth rate. And that's a doubling time of 119 years. Spain <coughs> has a growth rate of 0.04%. Spain will double its population in 1,750 years if it stays at that growth rate. Right? I saw a headline yesterday that Ireland's population just went through 5 million for the first time in about 40 years. Okay? Countries like Ireland and Italy and Spain and Russia and many countries, the population is shrinking. It's not growing, it's shrinking. As we'll look at next week, South Korea, Singapore, those two countries have the lowest population growth rate on the planet. And I'll show you how we, how we quantify that. Right? But their population is shrinking. Japan's the same thing. Okay. And so some countries are going to be grappling in the next 30 to 50 years with enormous population growth and everything that that brings. Some countries are going to be grappling with enormous population deficits, if that's the right phrase, and everything that that brings, right? How do we keep our culture going and the human capital going when people aren't having enough babies? Okay. Or that also means the population is aging. Okay. And what is that? There's a very important concept here in uh, population dynamics, and that's the concept between linear growth. I see everybody's masks are on, as I can tell. Thank you again. I appreciate that. Um, this relationship between 
nonlinear growth and linear growth, right? This was a concept that came up in the 1750s by a guy who wrote a famous essay, Thomas Malthus, on population and food. And he argued that populations were growing exponentially, but things like food was not, okay? And that we could run into trouble. And I've written a short piece on this. This is the old classic example of someone offered by the king a grain of rice uh, one day, and then another grain the next day, and another grain the next day, and another grain the next day. Or you're offered a grain of rice one day, and then two grains the next day, and you double that the next day, and you double that the next day. That's exponential growth or non-linear non growth, right? And by the time you get to the middle of the board, you, you don't have enough space to put the millions of grains of rice because of the way that that exponential growth is occurring. And, and we see this uh, in a number of systems, including the human population system, right? So I've just got population on the y-axis. I totally made up these numbers. Time on the x-axis, that could be hours, days, you know, hundreds of years, whatever the case may be. The point simply is that this is linear growth. We are adding the same vertical unit to every horizontal unit, and this is exponential growth, right? This is slow at first, and then it starts growing exponentially over time. That's the two grains of rice, the four, the eight, the 16, 32, 64, two, and, you know, and on it goes, okay? And there's a, I think there's a pretty strong argument here when you look at the data that human populations are looking like that or certainly part of that and that food production as an example has not grown at the same rate food production is lagging behind human population growth and we're going to look at that as well okay so how do populations actually grow over time what's the reality of human population growth or any population growth important diagram here you're going to see this diagram i would imagine sometime in the early weeks of october during our first little get together, because this ties up a couple of very important concepts, actually about three or four. So let's just break this down. So this diagram shows population on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, okay? And organismal growth, everybody. So if you were to put bacteria into a petri dish, right? Or possibly two rabbits into a hutch, okay? How would those organisms grow over time? Well, bacterial growth, we know, grows exponentially, right? 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and it grows very, very rapidly. And it grows along this yellowy J curve here that I've labeled biotic potential. So what is that? The biotic potential is the maximum rate of growth without any hindrance, right? No external factors whatsoever. If you didn't constrain, so in other words, it's unconstrained, organismal growth. So the organism's biotic potential. Okay. So yeah, rabbits have a high biotic potential. Okay, they grow pretty quickly. Elephants don't, right? They have one bob and it takes 16 months and whatever. And so different organisms grow at different biotic potential. So we've got the unrestrained growth of an organism. And then how do organisms really grow? Okay. Well what they do is they grow slowly at first, right, populations grow, then they begin to increase, but they tend to not grow at their biotic potential. Why? Because the environment sets a number of constraints on them, okay, in a system like the Earth atmosphere system. And this green part in the middle here, I've shaded in as environmental resistance. What is environmental resistance, right? These are the factors that I put up on the top right-hand side here. So if you've got organisms growing, and they're growing rapidly, at some point they start competing. At some point you start running out of oxygen. At some point you, not, you start running out of food supply. Okay, you may have predators coming in that would limit that growth, right? Space, disease could build up, toxins could build up. Does that make sense, right? There are this whole collective group of what we call environmental resistance that begins to put a check and balance on the rate at which populations grow in reality. And in theory, at least, a population or a group of species, or in fact, the entire planetary system, should begin to grow over time and then slow down as they approach their, and here's the big term that I mentioned at the outset, carrying capacity, right? What is the true carrying capacity 
of this particular ecosystem, whether you're looking at a smaller ecosystem or if you're taking a step back into outer space and you're looking at the entire planet, right? The carrying capacity. Okay. We know, for example, uh, in the game reserve that we're doing our rhino work on in South Africa, it's about, uh, it's about 20,000 acres, okay? but uh, a little less than 10,000 hectares. We know that that reserve has a carrying capacity. You can only put so many herbivores on there before they just graze everything and everybody's looking at each other with no grass or trees or right? Same with predators. We know we can't have, you know, a hundred impala and seven prides of lions in there. That's just going to end bad. They'll run out of food in a heartbeat, right? So we look at a managed ecosystem like that and you can figure out ecologically what its carrying capacity is. The challenge from our perspective, I think, everybody, is looking at the Earth and trying to figure out what is this horizontal line? Okay, what is the carrying capacity of this planet, as I said at the outset? Five billion? I think we're in trouble. If it's 15 billion, we've probably got some way to go. That does not mean everybody is going to be living fantastically wonderful, rosy lives, right? Because of inequity and access and so on. But for now, just keep that in mind that this carrying capacity is absolutely fundamental, right? It's critical to trying to determine uh, how many people we can fit on this planet. Now, can an, can an ecosystem uh, overshoot its carrying capacity? Absolutely, it can. And maybe we've already done that, right? Maybe this planet has gone through its carrying capacity. So we see this in many examples around the world, not from a human population, but from organismal populations, where you might have an upper carrying capacity and the population grows too quickly and it overshoots it and then you get dieback and then it grows and, and it sort of wobbles around and then reaches its equilibrium right if that makes sense okay and we see that here's just an example of where that occurs i'll just wrap up with this example this is isle royale national park it's an awesome national park in the middle of lake superior very very well studied and it's been especially well studied because it's an island on the relationship between wolves and moose and trying to determine what the carrying capacity of Isle Royale National Park actually is. I'm not going to ask you a question on this in the exam. This is a bit more detail, but just to look at the relationship between two species here. So we've got wolves on the left axis and the wolves are in blue and we've got moose on the right axis, right? And it shows how these populations have developed over time. Okay, so you can see when the wolves go down through disease, the moose go up, right? And when the wolf populations explode, then the moose go down, right? This relationship between predator and prey. It's not a perfect one-to-one -one relationship you wouldn't expect it to be. So we can look at small little ecosystems like Isle Royale National Park and look at the dynamics. But from this course perspective, again, we're gonna to wanna to look down at the earth uh, system uh, as a whole. And I think that's a good place to stop. Any questions? I know that's quite a lot of people have been uh, remember, there's no class on Wednesday, uh, Monday. So we can meet back here Wednesday and we're going to watch that. Okay, lab. You guys can find it to lab and that's it.